Hello. Hello. And I will be back. <laughs> Mr. Moore has uh, some concert tickets, and they happen to be maybe going on sale at noon. So he needs to make sure that they have not gone on sale yet. Um, but he'll be right back. Guys, happy Friday. Um, we've got a couple quick announcements. Stay. Stay stay. We have a couple quick announcements this morning to get through before we get started, but if you are new here, welcome, welcome. We haven't done an open Q&A, like a ask us anything type Q&A in a while. Why? There's a ghost in this chair. Are you guys watching this? Stay. Um, <laughs> my thing won't go live until one o'clock. No, one o'clock. Um, so... We have, first and foremost, a video that posted on Tuesday that you guys should absolutely go check out. I went over a list of all of my favorite free tools that I use pretty much every single day. Um, and of those tools, obviously, we talked about Trello all last week uh, during the Friday Bee, and I gave you guys the ins and outs and the full tour of how I use Trello in different ways. So that's included in there. But there's a lot of other free things, including the scheduling app that I use for social media. Um, a lot of these are going to be a recap because I try. this is one of those videos that I do every year, and um, a lot of the tools are the same as last year that, you know, I recommended last year. But because, you know, people are looking for the most up-to-date information. Some of you are new here and you haven't been around long enough to have seen that video. My favorite videos and the ones that I feel are the most relevant to you guys, I try to update every year. And this update for, for the video that I did on Tuesday just happened to be um, one of the main things that, you know, has changed for me is the scheduling app that I use, where last year I used Later and then this year I found Metricool, which just Metricool, which just happens to be significantly better in my opinion. So be sure to check out that video if you're interested. Um, I think that there's a lot of common misconceptions out there that you have to spend a butt ton of money on different like subscriptions to different tools in order to, nah. you know, be successful. And that's not true. There are some tools that I recommend once you reach the point of needing to pay for them. For example, E-Rank, a free plan, will yep. get you, you know, a, a great base foundation of, of um, you know, when you're doing your keyword research. But once you reach the next level, I do recommend paying for the $5.99 per month plan because I think that for the most, you know, Etsy sellers are going to be fine using that $5.99 per month plan. Um we do we do have a ten dollar a month plan, but honestly, start with the five ninety nine per month plan because it's very likely yeah. that it's very mm -hmm. likely you won't need that ten dollar per month plan until later. And then um, no. the only other one that I recommend, you know, once you like reach the point where you can pay for it, if you find that you're using Canva a lot, not an affiliate of Canva. I'm not an affiliate of any of the apps that I recommend, but Canva in particular, is one that I just have not regretted paying for. I love Canva. Canva um, is an amazing tool. I use it, too, yeah. frequently. Even just for normal life stuff, when I need to send somebody something that needs edited real quick, I use Canva. Yeah, Canva Pro is absolutely fantastic, and there's just so much that you can do with it. And when you start hitting those restrictions on, like, oh, you can't use, like, this graphic, or you can't use this background because it's, um, you know, part of the Canva Pro subscription, you know, it, it almost... You're like, oh, no, now I got to find something similar or that graphic was perfect. I just feel like Canva Pro is one of the few things that I've paid for that I don't regret paying for every year. So, um, but nice. the free subscription to Canva, if you're just starting out and you don't have the money because it is kind of pricey, it's like over $100 a year. Um, that free subscription, I used it for probably three or four years before I ever paid for it. So what I recommend is if there's ever a free like membership to an app or a tool that you want to use, Use the free membership until you literally outgrow it. That's that's kind of how I um, decide what to pay for. So, um, and then obviously Mailchimp once you get there or whatever your mail delivery service is once it's big enough to require you to pay for it. Exactly, exactly. Um, so there's that. Be sure to check out that video from Tuesday. Um, you guys can go ahead and get start getting some questions in while, sure. she's, while she's talking. We're doing an open Q and A today. Any question? There's no such thing as a stupid question here. So yeah, it's, it's Etsy business in general. SEO. Life, SEO. Yeah, it's been a while. You guys, you know, during the week, um, or during the week, during our normal Friday beans. Can you tell I'm kind of scatterbrained? I'm like all congested. It's all this. We have a level one snow emergency right now. We can't even leave the house. It's been so cold. Um, 
But during our, you mm. know, topic-based episodes of the Friday Bean, we usually have more questions from you guys than what we could answer. So I like to sprinkle these in every month or so. That way you guys can just ask us anything for, you know, an hour and a half. Um, but I think that's it. The only other thing that I really wanted to point out is that our 2024 marketing calendars are out now. Those are down below and they are free. Um, all you got to do is go in and, and click the link down below. Um, those 2024 marketing calendars this year, I feel are more important than ever because you really need to plan ahead this year. People are going to begin thinking about spring super early. Um, I dare say that right now you should be going ahead and getting some of those spring product lines out in your Etsy shops, primarily because most of the time, like people think of April as being spring, you know, that's when Easter is, but this year, Easter takes place in March. So people are going to be in like March mode or spring mode in March. And then come April, Easter's already over and people are going to start transitioning into summer um, earlier. Whereas normally people are still in spring mode in April. But once Easter passes, people start kind of moving into summer mindset. So I think that that is one of the things that's going to impact um <laughs> you know, the seasonality of our launches and when we should be planning for those popular seasons. And then we also have the election this year. Now, no politics in the chat. You guys know how we are. We don't we don't talk politics here. However, we do need to be aware that with a U.S. election taking place on November 5th, around any U.S. elections, no matter where in the world you are, which is kind of strange to me, but when the U.S. has our elections, it impacts um all like worldwide e-commerce so yeah, the whole world kind of seems to hold their breath exactly so just be prepared that with the um elections taking place on november 5th mm -hmm. even if you're you know in the uk or, or wherever you may be you might see an impact because people like to hold <clears throat> on to their money until you know everything's kind of settled down so with that in mind um i'm recommending that everybody plan for the holidays you know super early this year um, making sure that you have, you know, everything that we normally recommend that you do, getting your shops like spruced up, having your banner, you know, cleaned up. If you need to reshoot listing photos, if you need to, you know, spice up your SEO, making sure that you're doing that in the summer. That way you can be ready for whatever <laughs> the holiday season brings. People are either going to shop really early or what I suspect is they're going to shop really late this year. That way, you know, they can get through the election time and then things will kind of settle down and then hopefully people will resume their holiday shopping but um i'm good to answer some questions i hope you guys are staying warm i know that we're in ohio and the snow is really bad um but i know that there are surrounding states that are seeing it so much worse than we are so i feel bad yep. for you guys do do go up to the top since we're here. Happy Friday. Happy Somebody Friday. complimented my stash. Best Thank you very much. I love it. Stash. I assume your tickets aren't on sale yet. They are not. Okay. <laughs> you guys know how music festivals are. The tickets sell out in like two minutes because scalpers get in on them. Yeah. Uh, any news on Etsy? Something big is coming announcement. You yeah. know as much as we do. Yeah. So the something big coming is, keep in mind, that is at the top of the Etsy homepage where shoppers are. That's not for sellers. That's not something cool for sellers. That's going to be something for, for shoppers. And I believe that they already announced it. I thought it was some type of gift thing to help, unless that wasn't the announcement. But I believe that it's some type of gift category for shoppers. So I was about to say, if it's something meant for shoppers, good chance it's going to be a pain in the butt for sellers. Yeah, so. it, it's. I believe it was some type of gift category, unless that's just something else new that they rolled out and there's still something else new coming. But <clears throat> just remember that if it's something for sellers, it'll be on our back end, like shop dashboard, you know, when you're on the back end and you can see like your active listings and your revenue and all that. That's where announcements for us will be. They're usually right at the top. If it's for buyers and something that's going to make like shopping easier, it's going to be on the Etsy homepage like this announcement was. But I do believe that it was already announced as being some shopper Somebody said, thing. love your scrunchie. I'm going to be real with you. I forgot I had it in. I normally switch out for a hair tie, but I tie it up in a scrunchie real tight when I'm doing my mustache because it's more comfortable. Aww, if Jason Momoa can go out in They're a pink comfortable. scrunchie. comfortable. I don't care. He always wears big I'm six fuzzy. foot tall, 235. I can wear a freaking scrunch me, scrunchy. And scrunch me. Scrunch me. Scrunch me. Scrunch me. Is that is that how I scrunch you? Scrunch uh, you? 
How long does it take after changing a title and tags for it to start getting traction again on Etsy? I mean, technically it's immediate. Yeah, so when you change tags and titles on Etsy, so, okay, let me let me backtrack. Let's start at the beginning. And in the beginning, when you first list an item on Etsy, you know, you create a new listing and, and you list it, Etsy needs time to shuffle that listing all around um, and understand how shoppers interact with it. You get a slight boost in search during that time frame, and that's Etsy showing that listing to different types of people and, and deciding what your listing is, who should see it. And this, in turn, will hopefully grow your listing quality score if that listing receives positive interaction from customers. A lot of people say, like, when will I start ranking? Well, technically, you're ranking immediately. You might not be ranking well, but you are immediately ranking. When you make edits to your listing, there is no real answer for how long it takes. Um, if you've made a major listing overhaul, you guys know that I always say, like, don't go in and do that, you know, old myth, or it's not a myth, it used to be true like 10 years ago, but it doesn't work anymore, where people would go in and renew all of their listings for 20 cents in order to get a boost. That doesn't work anymore. However, if you have made major changes to a listing's tags and titles, um, and you've got new keywords in there, and you've done like a big overhaul, I do recommend, I I edited the ads this time. I'll We'll talk about it in a minute. Okay. Um, that was one of the announcements I needed to make today, okay. and I forgot. So if you have made a major overhaul to that listing, I personally, and this is just what I do, I go in and I renew that that single listing for 20 cents um, just to see if Etsy will begin noticing those, those new keywords that I have put in there. I, I am assuming in what we have, you know, kind of... Um, Tanya Chu. What we've kind of observed... Um, is that if you renew that listing, Etsy, you know, can kind of get a jolt and be like, oh, okay, new keywords and start looking at those listings for those new keywords. And then they're going to do the same process of moving that listing and, and trying to see who's going to be interested in it. There is no set time frame. You know, if you were to say, make edits to a listing, get some new keywords in there. Those keywords were like really hot at the time. The competition was low. You found a great sweet spot and people start, it started engaging with that listing immediately and maybe started, you know, buying it and leaving good reviews for it. You would probably start ranking higher pretty quickly because Etsy would notice that people are interested in that item, and therefore they would Etsy would then start recommending that item to more people because Etsy wants to make money too. And if you've got a listing that's doing well, Etsy knows that they're going to also make more money if they show that listing to new people. However, same goes for if you put a bunch of crappy keywords in your listing and nobody's clicking on it. You know, Etsy's going to say, okay, well, obviously nobody's interested in this thing. We're going to show it to less people and less people and less people. So the answer is there is no answer. Um, what's most important is getting that good interaction from customers right when you have made those changes. Yeah, we do We do questions in the order in which they are asked. So what's wrong? What's wrong, Tanya? No, nothing. She posted it's a question a twice. We'll get to you. Uh, what about Alora? We cannot speak on behalf of companies we don't work for. We know where E-Ranks data comes from. We know who buys it. And we know that, at least within our ability to verify, that it is ethically sourced. Yeah. That's all that really matters. I'm a manager at E-Rank. Um, E-Rank is, I mean, you guys can use our, we've got a sites tool over at E-Rank where you can compare traffic of different SEO tools, including ours. We're the biggest. We've got the most users, which, you know, that leads us to make the educated guess that we probably make more money than the other SEO services simply because we have a larger user base. And that means we can afford better and more data. Exactly. So I and can't speak on behalf of them because I can't see their data. I see a lot of people who say like, oh, the things I'm seeing in this tool are different. Like the search volumes I see from this tool are different from what I see in E-Rank. Yeah, because it's not, you, you don't want to play apples to apples. Everybody's getting this data from different sources. Etsy doesn't give this data out when it comes to keyword search volumes. Now, a lot of E-Ranks tools do come directly from Etsy's API, like the Rank Checker. Um, however, when it comes to search volumes, it's just like Nielsen ratings for TV. You know, every everybody back in the day would get their little Nielsen box, the Nielsen families, and then mm. that's how they would collect TV ratings by observing what these families were watching. That's how the data that SEO tools is also 
acquired. There are specific people, and thankfully we have data panels of millions and millions of people, um, who opt to have their data collected and, and their shopping habits monitored so that that data can be sold to places like E-Rank. Um, and with E-Rank, like I said, thankfully, we are able to acquire data sets in the millions and millions of panelists. And what this does is it gives us the most accurate average that we could possibly get. Um, and occasionally you'll get a keyword that says like no data. That just means that of the millions of people that we had in our panel, nobody within those millions of people was searching for that thing. And rather than us trying to guess, we just let you know that we don't know. It happens occasionally. But I hope that answers your question. Well, that's the best way to organize my stock. I've things, seen things about SKU barcodes, and I have no idea how to keep the physical system and how to connect it to a spreadsheet. Everybody's going to have a different manner of organization depending on their products, their space, to, and what works for you. Yeah, you're going to have to pick what works for you. That's kind of the only thing we can really tell you. There's yeah. a lot of stuff integrated with Etsy, but there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that can describe what... He's about to start causing trouble, I can tell. Who, him? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but about to be a pain in the butt. If you want to chat based on maybe like your products and maybe your space... <laughs> Did he run away? He ran away. If, if you want to chat with others, um, I would recommend joining, if you're not already in, the Handmade Alpha Facebook community. It's linked down in the video description. Um, join that and feel free to ask people, maybe people in your industry, how they keep track of their own inventory. Now, before we go on, I did want to mention, if you guys are getting ads, I got an alert from YouTube that they wanted me to try some new, you know, mid-roll ad thing where people who watch, for, <clears throat> I think you watch for 30 minutes and you get an ad. They just got one. Rather than getting bombarded with ads, you're only supposed to get one every 30 minutes. And it's it's supposed to be unique per user. So if they watch, okay. if they start watching like halfway through, they won't get it until 30 minutes. Just let us know how it is. Because YouTube basically told us that we were not making nearly as much money as we were last year. And to turn this thing on. Adpocalypse version 2 is happening. Yeah, so I turned it on. Just keep in mind, like, I get about 20 emails a day from different tools who offer to pay me to promote their tools. And there's nothing wrong with that. You guys see most YouTubers do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to get paid to recommend things that I don't use, you know? So instead... We just have ads on our videos and we get paid when they play. And I think that that's enough. Um, but when YouTube starts saying, hey, you're like starting to go like backwards, that's when I'm like, all right, well, maybe then I'll take their suggestion. But if it becomes like something that's super annoying to you guys, like more so than your normal ad experience, just yeah. let us know and we can turn it off. I got one within three minutes of jumping on. I've gotten two ads so far. We're 15 minutes in. Okay. So. We're probably gonna have to turn this off. I don't know if it'll stop <clears throat> on this per on the single it, video. It won't. We won't be able to do it until the next live stream. We apologize for that. That's it's the unfortunate, uh, unfortunate world of YouTube. Yeah, it's only supposed to play after thirty minutes, so that's unfortunate. Stick with us though. On the Mickey topic, I'm not doing Mickey, but what can you advise about making parody items? Etsy. I wouldn't do a lot of parody on Etsy. Etsy doesn't honor a parody mm -hmm. legally. No. If you are on your own website, there are laws that will allow you to use parody and satire legally. It's, um, a, it's a gray zone. It, it It is. Because tech... Dogs having a freak out. <laughs> because technically parody is legal. You're allowed to parody things, but it has to be so far detached from the thing. Etsy's just going to side with the copyright holder, and copyright holders just attack people doing parody a lot of the time. So I, I, if you want to go for it, <clears throat> all you, but I wouldn't touch it with a ten foot pole. Yeah, because even because Etsy always sides with the larger party. Yeah, um, that's just how it is. And even then, even if you were doing satirical items, you would almost still need to use the keywords associated with the original IP in order to gain traction for that IP. And if you use those keywords, then it's still, you're still profiting from the intellectual property. Um, so again, if you're on your own website, it's a little bit different. I would still consult with a lawyer because there it's, there's a gray line between <laughs> what's parody and what's not. Um, but I wouldn't play around with it on Etsy. It's just, it's too risky. 
Uh, nothing using uh, noticed using E rank that there are several keywords that have unknown for search but have competition and engagement. Why is that? Because we can we can see competition that we can go to Etsy and yes, see that there are listings for it. Right, we can competition <clears throat> is easy to gauge because we can see how many other listings are using those t same terms. However, when it comes to the data that comes through our data providers. If of our millions of panelists, nobody has searched for that specific term, what that tells us is that, you know, there may be competition for it, but we don't know what the demand looks like. And again, rather than guessing or trying to estimate it, we leave it as unknown. So it, the, sometimes these terms are worth experimenting with. If you notice that there, you know, that your competitors, for example, are using these terms, these might be terms that are being searched. It just might mean that nobody in our millions of panelists are using them. And I actually really like experimenting with these terms, especially if you're fairly confident that people are searching for them. Because imagine all your competitors are also using E-Rank and they are all seeing that that term is unknown. And they assume that unknown means that no one's searching for it. Well, now you have that little golden nugget from the E-Rank manager that says, oh wait, unknown doesn't necessarily mean bad that keyword could be the thing that helps your listing. So I always experiment with those terms that come up with unknown if I'm fairly confident that people are searching. For example, um, in my shop, we are officially licensed by several large authors. And I put their book names in our tags and titles because I have the right to do so. However, some of these book titles, they're not being searched for on Etsy. But if someone were to search for that book title on Etsy, it would only be me that is in that group. And since my listing is specifically based around, you know, that book, then obviously that's a term I want to use. So um, with that in mind, just don't be afraid to experiment with them. Do you recommend expanding Etsy brand to other sites like Redbubble? I mean, if you have the time and the ability to be able to manage stock between two stores, I mean, Redbubble's easy though. Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you create artwork or you know um, photography or you know any type of design, Redbubble is so easy. My my child who is 11 years old has a Redbubble because all you have to do is upload your art, add your tags and titles and uh, descriptions and choose the items you want it printed on, and you're done. You don't have to communicate with customers. Uh, you don't have to worry about when things shipped. Customers, you can make it so they can't even message you, which is what we do for you know our daughter's shop. Literally, all you're doing is basically giving Redbubble your artwork. Redbubble is doing all the work, and you get a little commission back from those sales. I have um, a Redbubble that I have not logged into in probably a year and a half, and I still have money coming in from it because it's just perpetual. Same with don't, Taylor. Don't spam your questions. Yeah, don't don't spam your questions. We'll get to them. They're in order. Um, but with that in mind, Redbubble is really low maintenance. You're not going to make a lot of money on Redbubble. I think like I made eighty five dollars last year, <laughs> so it's I wouldn't expect to make like a million dollars, but I consider it free money. It's like, hey, I did all this work up front a couple years ago, and now it just keeps selling, so I let it yeah. go. Uh, SEO, my views are too low, but I do use relevant keywords for my niche. Uh, lack of traffic is a lack of sale. What can I do? Your views are... Okay, so um, just because your keywords are relevant doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to get traffic. Um, there, there are a lot of other factors. Remember, it's not just an algorithm that says you, you have good keywords, therefore you deserve money. That's not how it works. A real living breathing human being has to see that listing and search and decide they want to buy it. So um, regardless of if you think you're using good keywords, if they're not bringing you traffic, either you're not using good keywords or the keywords aren't connecting with your audience or the items that you're making aren't in demand. And unfortunately, you've kind of got to figure out which of those factors is 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 the truth. You know, there you have to kind of go through this process of elimination. Um, if you've never sold anything, in your shop or you have very, very few sales, it might mean that your niche isn't in demand or it might mean that you're creating designs within your niche that aren't in demand or it might mean that you need to do a little bit of tweaking. So um, unfortunately, there's nobody who can really tell you the answer. I would start 
I, and what I usually recommend people do is start with your photos. I, I know that that sounds crazy, but if you think that your keywords are good and you know that there's demand for them and you're relatively certain that your niche has demand, um, then I would start with your photos. Even if you think your photos are good, try swapping them around. You know, take the photo that's in your second photo slot and swap it to the first, you know, um, or go try to reshoot some photos. Or if you're using mock-ups, maybe try some different mock-ups. That's like something super duper easy that you can do to start with. Um, and then, you know, I would also start looking at things like your pricing, not just, you know, possibly pricing too high, but you might also be pricing too low. There are tons of people who will tell you in our in our chat that they have experienced more sales by raising their prices because the perception of quality increases the more that your price increases. So if you're pricing at the bottom of the barrel trying to compete with, you know, those Temu Alibaba price points, then yeah, people are going to perceive you at that value and people are going to think, wow, that's probably something kind of crappy. I'm going to opt for the product that costs a little bit more because I'm more confident that it's going to be better quality. So again, you just kind of got to go through that process of elimination to figure out what the actual issue is. Now that I'm niched down, how many types of products should I have in my shop? There, I mean, that's really up to you. There is no specific amount of items. Yeah. I wouldn't go posting like a thousand items in your store, but I mean. Yeah, there's no magical number. Um, I think that it depends on your product. For example, if you made like beautiful golden diamond engagement rings and I went in your shop and that you had thousands of listings, but you claimed that they were all handmade. I'd be a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. Unless I saw your shop had been on there since like 2005. Yeah, but I, mm -hmm. I would be a little suspicious, you know. Um, however, if you made like sticker sheets, for example, and you had a thousand listings and, you know, your sticker sheets for like five bucks each, I wouldn't bat an eye, you know, that a thousand stickers makes sense. That sounds like something easy. So just... um you know, be mindful of what your products are and how your customers might perceive them. But in terms of like some golden number, there's like a myth out there that you have to have a hundred listings before you'll start ranking and before you'll make sales. That's not true. That's, there's no, no fact behind that. Uh, are you able to use photo reviews <clears throat> in social media or elsewhere as testimonials, including your separate Shopify stores? Yeah. So, so technically you should contact them to request because they took the picture Technically, they're posting it publicly. It's probably okay for you to use it. But as a common courtesy, you should ask them if it's okay if they use or if you use their review yeah. as a testimonial. It's just courtesy. Um, I will, it, it, in the times that I've done it, I'll I'll just not include their profile photo. And yeah. if, if their Omit name. their name. Yeah, if their name is like Ashley Clark or something, I'll just put like Ashley as the review name mm. and make, you know, my own little review template. There's actually really nice ones on Canva. If you go to Canva and just type in like um, review into their templates, they've got some really nice ones. And then you can kind of customize it the way you want so that you don't just have to grab a screenshot. Uh, is there any way to start an Etsy shop without being forced to first create a product? No. No. Um, as of right now, no. No, what I do is if I'm starting a new shop, I create, I just, I make it say custom listing and I just upload a random photo. Um, and then for the title, I just put in like custom listing, do not buy. And I start it that way. And then, you know, I make the price, you know, just a couple dollars. That's a good way to just get your shop open. Um, that's what I've always done. What is direct traffic? Uh, if I haven't had a shop for long and my link isn't posted anywhere, how would anyone get to my shop using a direct link? Um, I don't know how anyone would get to your shop, but the three types of traffic are, uh, internal, external, and, um, direct. So internal, that's going to be Etsy SEO. External is going to be like social mar media marketing direct. I mean, using a, using Google would probably get you direct. Like if you searched for Google and clicked on it, I think that would probably also count as direct because yeah. it's not ad unless they clicked on a link no, in that Google that in, posted to ad. That would be in your SEO section of, because there's SEO and then there's Etsy search. And a lot of people right. think that the SEO is Etsy SEO, but in your shop stats, you've got SEO and that's Google SEO and search algorithm or search. Um, oh, browsers. Um, darn it. 
I'm not paying like search attention. bars. What uh, search engines? That's the one I'm. Good lord. Search engines. My <laughs> brain isn't working today. No. Like uh, the SEO section in your shop stats is search engines, and then the one that says like Etsy search. That's your Etsy SEO. Um, so the short answer, Carla, is I don't know. Um, it's not a bad thing though. I, I, w- I would be happy that people are finding me. <laughs> Is it possible to make money on Etsy? It's not 2020 anymore, and it's so saturated. Well, people are still selling on Etsy, and Etsy still is making record money, so I, mean, I would say so. I've got tons of students <clears throat> who make their living on Etsy. Um, we have a new Etsy shop that we just started September 1st, and I think we've got like 68 sales so yeah, far. Not, our shop definitely isn't sustainable yet, but it's getting there. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was purely an experiment to see because everybody says, like, is Etsy even making money anymore can you start a new shop and be yes. successful yeah we we did it <laughs> flip your mindset dog yeah you just got to learn and make sure that you're not just re- trying to do what everybody else is doing you do have to have something that is unique that customers want to buy mm-hmm. uh we have just started doing markets we're in london and uk what add-ons or apps can you recommend to use to organize stock or complete sales when selling at markets i couldn't tell you I'm not, that's not something that I do. So unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to give you any advice. What I would recommend, Holly, is to pop into the Handmade Alpha Facebook community down below. Um, join our group and ask in there because it's very likely that there's somebody who actually does, um, you know, live vendors events that would be able to help you way more than I ever could. Um, unfortunately, it's just not my wheelhouse. Mike. Are you cheating on me? Who's Mike? <laughs> Hi, Starla and Mike. Hi, I'm, Mike. I'm Mark, spelled with a C, not Kark, Mark. I'm assuming it was a yeah, autocorrect. I I, yeah, I know. Uh, I have a question about reviews. If I respond publicly, the buyer can't update or delete the review. Yes. I offered a refund. How long should I wait before I post a diplomatic review? Um, I mean, I would give them a few days, but, you know, it... it they where how did you offer the refund did you did you message them privately on etsy i would give them until the end of the week and if they haven't gotten back with you i would just go ahead and respond to that review and remember respond to the review not like you're responding to that person because they don't get a notification that you've replied to their review you don't write it like you're talking to them you write that response to your review as if you are speaking to your future customers who are looking through your reviews so i would say something like you know Customer was offered a refund, but sadly did not respond. I am always happy to help resolve issues when they're brought to my attention. You know, something like that tells future buyers, oh, okay, this person is, this seller is willing to help. The buyer just never asked for help. So that's that's how I would handle it. Uh, I already jumped the gun on this, but I toggled Etsy ads while I'm going through HAA, so they're currently off. Can't afford them anyway. They ate all but $2 of my profits. Mm. Is that a terrible idea? Mm. No, if you can't afford... Don't go to a $100 steak dinner if you've got $105 in your account. Exactly. Right? Go buy groceries for the week. If you can't if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. I don't I don't use Etsy ads. I don't use Etsy ads. I think that we accidentally had them turned on over the holidays and we ended up losing money on a couple sales because Etsy just automatically turned them on. Thanks, Etsy. We didn't notice it right away. Um, but again, there's another myth going around. It, it's all these weird Etsy gurus that popped up out of nowhere, like all these weird drop shipping. People. Spend a thousand dollars a day on ads. No, that's stupid. Yeah, you don't have to. Ads are not required. I mean, unless you make over ten thousand dollars on. Then Etsy. they're literally required. And offsite ads are, but yeah. Um, but no, okay. ads are not required for success. You can turn them off. If you notice yourself going in the red, turn them off. You know, it's, it's once again, it's a gamble. You're gambling. It's okay to go to the casino for fun and gamble every once in a while, but you don't bet the house on it. You know, it, it's okay to turn those off. Don't, don't make yourself feel like you're never going to be successful if you don't opt for Etsy ads. They're not necessary her question got kind of lost in the middle here how can i have someone edit my shop to know what i'm doing wrong i've not made any sales um you should never ever 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 have someone outside of your like direct little circle of people that you actually work with one-on-one edit your shop no do not pay an seo person to like seo your shop that's not a good idea the thing is if they end up getting banned for whatever reason on any shop that they're working on It's tied to the IP address they're using. So the internet service provider, the identification that they're given, it's tied to that. So if your shop is listed on that, not only will the shops that they're working on get banned, yours will too. And there is nothing you're going to be able to do about that. 
So don't ever have somebody else work on your shop unless there's somebody that's like in your house that knows what they're doing to do that. And you probably won't get a chance to. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Tanya, here's the thing. Um, running a business takes a lot of work. And you've got to learn a lot. And the unfortunate thing is most people join Etsy and they think like, oh, I've listed my items and now I don't know what to do. Yeah. Or I've listed my items and but they're not selling. What do I do? The sellers that are successful are the ones who spend the time saying, okay, I have my items and now I need to research demand and now I need to research my keywords and now I need to take a photography class and now I need to, you know, there are a lot of stages to success and some people are willing to put in that work and those are the people that you see, you know, like here in our chat who are kicking butt, asking specific questions, you know, tackling categories like, okay, this month we're going to learn SEO and we're going to do all this stuff to tackle SEO. And then there are the people who say, you know, oh, that's just too much. I don't, I'm not going to worry about all that. You have to be the one to comp compete among the people who are kicking butt and, and working and learning every single day. Um, you will never be done learning when it comes to no. the success of your business. Every day is learning. Every day is trying new things. Yes. So my biggest advice, because it sounds like you're new, is to... Start with um, some of the free courses I have down below. If mm -hmm. you open the bit, the video description, I would start with the free Etsy SEO toolbox, the um, Etsy SEO oodles. It's down there because SEO is the roadmap that leads shoppers to your storefront. Yep. And there are so many components when it comes to SEO. In that SEO toolbox, I've got my Science of Etsy Su Success Workshop. It's the very first video in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. And that covers... All seven factors that we know of that contribute to Etsy search and, and how people find you. That way you can start crafting your business in a way that appeals to Etsy's algorithm. So Etsy is more <laughs> likely to show you to more people. Um, you, you There are so many components, though. Um, but start there. There's also, you know, the free calendars are down there. The Instagram challenge kit is down there. If you want to start doing some marketing of your shop, you know, I think that Instagram is a great way to start getting people from social media to your business. But just tackle things in steps, you know, SEO, branding, photography. Um, Christina Nicole is my favorite photography coach. She's got a YouTube channel with mm -hmm. tons of awesome videos. If, if somebody could, could you pop Christi by Christina Nicole if you already know how to spell her name and are familiar with her channel? Yeah, I can't click off of this. I'll lose all these questions. Yeah, could one of you guys type in her <clears> channel <throat> name for me? That way, you know, everybody knows what it is. Sorry, a lot of conversations taking place, so it's It's okay. Full um, chat. But with that in mind, you know, take things small steps at a time and there, and just know that there's no timeline to your success. It's not like, oh, I need to make sales by this date. No, this is going to take time. Um, you've got to learn something completely new. And if you're new to this, it's going to take a little bit more time because you don't know what you don't know. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, but I've got thousands of videos on my channel. So do a deep dive. Pick a topic. Don't try to learn everything at once. You know, start with something like SEO before moving on to the next topic. Right. And I know that you had said that in your later post that you're not tech, tech savvy. Nobody is starting out. Well, I, I mean, if you're not used to computers, unfortunately, nobody can nobody can help you with that. But you there's a ton of YouTube videos and resources and things. And if you're behind on how to use computers, then it's up to you to catch up on how to use computers. That's the unfortunate truth with it. You know, yeah. at one point in time, all farmers used horses and donkeys. But then as soon as things like tractors and big farm equipment came out, the farmers that stood out on top are the ones that bought the farm equipment and learned how to use it. And the ones who were still using horses and donkeys fell behind and lost their businesses. Like, exactly. You, you have to be willing to advance and learn the new technology as it comes out or you're going to get lost in the fold. That's that's just how it is. Yeah. Like I always say, mm -hmm. you took the very best, like savvy salesman from the 60s who could sell any car you know he came to work with that big white smile every morning and sold a car every day like if you were to time travel him to 2024 he'd be useless he would not be able to sell anything he he'd would probably get slapped for yeah one. He, he would be a useless salesman because he didn't adapt you have to adapt with the changes mm -hmm. so um time isn't holding still it's always going to move forward we always have to learn yeah. new things but 
On the bright side, we've got students that are in their 80s. So I don't care, you know, if it's an age thing where you think that you can't do it. I promise you, you can. It just, you have yes. to be really, really open-minded and, and willing to treat it like school, you know? And sometimes you can make that fun. Get yourself a notebook, get some pretty colored pens, get yourself, you know, some Lisa Frank folders and make it something fun. Because if you enjoy that and if it feels fun to you, then you're going to remember it a lot better. I love school shopping season for that exact reason because I can get age, pretty folders. Age is a number old as a mindset that's true that's true uh that. any tips on marketing during the slow month of january market as usual yep um it's it's a slow month we can't make people buy when they aren't willing to buy my biggest advice is to build your presence um so for example like with the instagram challenge kit again that's free it's linked down below that the objective of marketing isn't always to make someone immediately go buy. On average, it takes seven interactions with a brand in order to turn somebody who, you know, is seeing your content to turn them into a an interested shopper. So that's seven pieces of social media content. That could be seven posts. It could be seven uh, you know, Instagram stories. It could be an Instagram story, a reel, a post, you know, any combination of seven pieces of, of content or contact with your brand. So with that in mind, think of January as a great way to start building good interactions and forming connections with that audience because maybe they're not buying today, but by warming them up through the month of January and February, maybe by March when, you know, maybe they'll be ready to buy, you've had the opportunity to make those seven positive interactions. You've you've had the opportunity, maybe they comment on one of your posts and you thank them or you, you know, start a discussion with them. These are all ways to help warm them up so that they are more willing to buy in the future. So every follower that you get on social media has the potential to become a customer in the future. It likely won't happen right away, but make sure that even when you're not making sales, you're not ignoring um, your marketing efforts. All right. We have a lot. We should try to speed, okay. up, speed up a little bit. I'm not. Uh, <clears throat> my objective isn't speed. Uh, I'm trying to decide what product I should put my design on next. Where's the best place to do product research? You can do it on E-Rank. Um, if you go, are you a print-on-demand uh, seller, Sean? If you go to E-Rank and go into the, um, under the trends tab, we have a monthly trends report. Then on the left-hand side of the screen, after you click monthly trends, there is a panel of different categories, and we recently added a print-on-demand category. And then you'll see things like shirts, mugs, hoodies, yada, yada. Um, those are the items that Printify have shared with us are their most popular items. And then from there, you can click on one of those categories. So you could click on shirts, and you can see the most popular shirts that shoppers have searched for. Now, what you got to be aware of is that sometimes there will be terms in there, like, for example, Taylor Swift shirt. Just because people are shopping for Taylor Swift shirt, it doesn't mean that you can make Taylor Swift shirts because obviously you will get in big trouble for copyright. Um, but you can get, you know, some decent ideas of things that you could make. What's the matter? What's going on? Oh. We will not teach you how to do illegal things on this channel. Please do not ask. Uh, is there a way to list... All of our Etsy stores open with the same email address. Thank you. No, unfortunately, no. you got to have a different email address for every every shop. Um, you can have the same bank for all your shops, but you have to have different email addresses, which kind of sucks. Uh, do you use Canva for your social posts and reels? Yep. Uh, if not, what are your faves for social posts? I think they mean to post your stuff, like posting them from Canva. Do you, okay, so uh, let me. Um, I'll, I'll split that in two because both are good questions. Um, so I use Canva to design my social posts, um, unless I'm just snapping them with my camera. I use Canva for some of my reels. Some of my reels I just record with my phone and edit with the CapCut app. I actually have a video I just posted on Tuesday that talks about all this. It talks about my free favorite free tools that I use, um, for Etsy, but I use the CapCut app to edit those reels. Now for scheduling, I actually don't use Canva. I do pay for Canva, um, but I don't use their scheduler, so I can't really weigh in too much about how to use it. I I've played with it in the past. It's just, it's not my favorite. I use Metricool for scheduling out my content. I really like that it provides um, high level 
analytics so I can actually see how my, you know, how my posting schedule has directly impacted my views. And then I can toggle between the places that I'm posting to. So I can compare like Instagram to Twitter to uh, Pinterest, for example, and I can see, you know, what's doing best. So I don't know if you were talking about content creation or if you were talking about, um, you know, scheduling, but that's that's everything that I personally use. I have a very different product, celebrations and gifts sealed inside of a can. Oh. I'm wondering if it's not too niched and not a good fit for Etsy. So what you've described <clears throat> is very unique and there's likely not people searching for gifts in a can. However, how can you sell it in a way that, you know, when people discover it, they're like, wow, this is something completely mm -hmm. new I never thought to search for. You're probably just going to need to target keywords that are completely unrelated to gifts sealed in a can. Um, I would start looking for crazy terms like uh, maybe white elephant gift ideas or unique birthday gifts or if there are a way, if, if they're for children, you know, gifts for children ages 10 and up. Um, you're just going to have to get creative with the keywords that you're using because just just because you've created a new product, it doesn't mean that you can fit yourself into a, a niche that is in demand. I would dare say that there's probably not many people searching for things in a can, gifts in a can, but mm -hmm. there probably are people searching for white elephant gifts. Um, that's just like Johnny from um, Frosty Lab, and I can't say his other shop name, but he made little phallic objects for pranks that you could stick on like people's tire valve covers you know you could <laughs> stick one on your buddy's tire and he'd drive around all day and not realize there was a little green or maybe you just want it on there right i would i almost bought, i've almost bought them before i knew it was him right they're 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 <clears throat> meant for pranks you know you stick it on there and somebody's driving around with a little ding dong on their car all day not realizing it um but you know there's not a lot of people searching for little ding dong tire valve cover you know you he know he had to use keywords related to like pranks and stuff mm -hmm. and he found a niche and his product became very very popular so you just have to kind of find a niche that could that you could kind of squeeze into even though your product itself is is unique uh recently i've seen i've seen chat gbt used to create marketing strategies and tips what's your take okay couple things one i think it's good for like base level knowledge. However, mm -hmm. I wouldn't use it for specifics because chat GPT is usually two to three years behind on data. The most recent data set, I don't know when it was, but I think it's 2021 or 2022. So if you ask it for specifics on things like Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, all of that stuff, that information is two to three years behind. So it's not relevant. Yeah. However, strategies, tips, how to market, where to market, what to market, that kind of stuff, probably okay to a degree, but you need to, it's better if you have a little bit of an understanding on it from like a natural perspective before you rely on AI to do everything for you. Because for one, that might not always be there. Regulations are probably going to come hammering down. I would I would suspect from the EU first and then the US there will probably have. follow. Well, I mean, more strict, right. like nobody's going to follow what the EU says right away. Same with uh, any of the email marketing stuff. Most people were like, eh, it won't bother us for like the first year. And then they sued a couple people and then everybody paid attention. But either way, I would only use it with a grain of salt and make sure that you try to get a base level understanding of marketing yourself before using a tool like that. It's nice to have something that can remind you of all the different things that you can do because you might forget, oh, yeah, I can do that one thing. That's that's wonderful. I do it with music. But I wouldn't rely strictly on something like AI to do anything in life. Yeah. And <clears throat> as for, I know a lot of people ask, you know, can I use it to do my like keyword research? Chat GPT doesn't understand search volumes. So it'll recommend what it thinks might be what people search for, but it doesn't have the data behind it. So it's just making educated guesses. Now, over at eRank, we do have our listing helper tool. Um, and that is a chat GPT based tool that will give you suggestions for your Etsy tags, titles, and descriptions based on a brief description of your item that you enter in. 
And we recently added to that tool recommended tags, but we give you their search volume. So even if it recommends a crappy tag, you'll see right away, oh, okay, it recommended this tag, but this tag isn't really being searched for, so maybe I shouldn't use it. So with those two things together, um, you can kind of take the information from ChatGPT and compare it to the actual search volumes to, to check it for yourself to decide if it's um, something that might work for your shop. Uh, what's up with the Etsy new rule about the other shipping option and shipping profile? How does it affect us POD sellers? Um, I answered you yesterday in the student campus, I believe. Um, I don't know right now, unfortunately. You guys, um, know just as much as I do. So I'm going to assume that POD businesses are all going to, um, probably act on this relatively quickly. So as soon as I know something, I'll share it with you guys. But I'm just going to assume for now that the POD providers are going to take care of it for us. Um, I'll let you guys know if there's anything that we, you know, find out that we need to do. Yeah, we're going to turn off the ads next time around. I've had three ads, two or five minutes apart. I'm I sorry, got, guys. I got one ad at for The thing is, we I can even show you guys we have it set to one ad per person every 30 minutes. So it's YouTube. Pop it, pop it. Are you refreshing your page or moving from like all like clicking off of the tab and coming back? Because I think YouTube, when you start a video you get an ad regardless mm -hmm. just like twitch and every other streaming platform that's normal so if you're clicking off from tab to tab and coming back that also might be what's doing it um i don't know i can't see what you guys are doing can you pop open my ad thing or oh did you close it already i did this so i could ban somebody oh okay i was just curious that every third estimated yeah, just... fr estimated frequency Every yeah. 30 minutes. Screen share. Screen share it real quick. Yeah. You're going to get, you guys are going to get doubles and triples. Oh, that's okay. Triples of the Nova. What? Yeah. Look, look, what? They lied. Liars. Anyway. Okay. Well. Sorry about that. We're, we'll turn that off or turn it to mid rolls again. I have it. I usually turn it completely off, but no, you. We'll turn it. We'll turn it off for, for this kind of stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. What I think we should do, and I'll do this as an open forum because I think it's it's better. There's a lot of conversations taking place, which I'm totally cool with. I've also, this live stream is our biggest one since way before Christmas. Cool. Um, I think that what because there's so many conversations, if I scroll down, like 50 questions are going to get lost. I think that we could turn on uh, like limit the amount of time somebody can post like one post every 30 seconds like we do for our HA stuff and our critiques and all that kind of stuff. And then just open super chat. If you want to, if you want to post like four things very quickly, then you've got to do super, this super chat. Super chat is open. I know, but we can do uh -oh. that plus limiting this and that'll keep the chat clean because it's starting to get a little bit unmanageable with the amount of people. Have you run any promotion sales on social getting over the Q1 slump? Getting over the Q1 slump from the holidays. Have you run any promotion sales on social? Um, have I? No, I have not. Um, just keep in mind that if people aren't shopping, a sale or a promotion isn't going to make them shop. It's not going to hurt you to run one. I mean, if you want to run one, then run one. Um, but just, you know, this is something that happens to everybody. Rather than, you know, trying to fight the natural order of shopping patterns and, and how consumers behave at certain times of year, sometimes it's better to just understand that in January, things are going to be slow because people don't have money. They spend it all for Christmas time. Um, I like to consider January a good time to organize and to plan for spring. And then when we hit our second slump, which is summertime, because people are spending more time outside and less time in front of their computers shopping, I like to consider summertime the time when we plan for the holidays and, you know, you get ready and make any adjustments that you need to adjust, add new products, uh, make your updates and, and things like that. But, you know, these, these slumps are normal. Do y'all have an updated video, video on integrating Google Analytics into E-Rank and Etsy? So I just went in <laughs> and up, I uh, went in and added my own Google Analytics to my Etsy shop to see how much it had changed. Um, to be perfectly honest, my old Google Analytics or Google Analytics video that I posted like two years ago, everything still applied, other than ticking the Universal Analytics box because obviously we're on Google Analytics four. So you, I followed that video to a T, just skipped the part about Universal Analytics, 
and set it up and it worked. So I haven't created anything new, but if you need to set it up like right now, go back and watch my video on Universal Analytics. All you got to search for is Starla Moore Google Analytics and it should pop right up. Um, hey, Pam. And you can technically still follow that video. It, it, it still all applies. We've recently updated our product descriptions and have been slowly updating the SEO okay. on our listings that aren't getting views. Is it better to update them all at the same time or slowly over time? Slowly over time. Never make mass edits to your shop other than photos and descriptions are okay for now. Yeah. Until descriptions become more heavy on the SEO side, then mm. and descriptions are okay now too. Yeah. I mean, this just goes with <clears throat> everything. You don't want to change a bunch of stuff all at once because if you were, I mean, this is just general rule of thumb. If you were to make a change that negatively impacted your shop, it would be better for it to negatively impact one listing as opposed to impacting all of your listings. And obviously, I'm, I'm sure that you already know my my golden rules of Etsy SEO are never touch the tags and titles of a listing that are selling well. You know, you don't want to touch those listings that are already bringing you traffic because you don't want to jinx anything or remove good keywords that are bringing you traffic. Um, and make your changes slow and gradual. You might think that you found a golden keyword, but if you go in and change all of your listings and add that keyword in there, you never know how that change could impact your shop. And it's better to potentially mess up one listing. Yeah. Like then, Scorpion said, it's important to know which changes caused which results. Exactly. And you that's, can't do that if you just spam edit everything. Yeah. Uh, is there a way for bulk upload and or planning product uploads? Um, there, I mean, there have been different tools over the years. I believe that Vela still allows you to, do they allow you to bulk upload? I can't remember. I personally never used any. Um, I'm sure that if you asked in our Handmade Alpha Facebook community if there's something like that that exists. I'm not a fan of bulk uploading a bunch of stuff, though. Um, sp spend your time, you know. If, if you want to get your listings ready, put them in draft, work on your drafts, and then publish them all at once. But I wouldn't recommend just bulk uploading as many products as humanly possible. When is the best time to trademark a brand? Oh, um... Uh, I mean, honestly, unless you're creating something 100% original from scratch by hand, it, I don't really think it matters. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it really depends. Because um, you have you have intellectual, copyright. yeah, you have intellectual copyright over your products from day one when you create it. As long as you have it posted on the internet, you own that brand. So you can copyright your brand. Trademark is a little different. Yeah, trademark. So you, copyright you automatically have. You can register for it so that it's easily can more, be a good idea. more easily defendable in court. Um, but, you know, as long as you have evidence that it is your creative copyright, that's a little bit different. But trademarking like your business name and your company name, I, I guess it just completely depends on, on what your goals are. And if you're wanting to build a long-term brand, if you're just making a couple sales here and there, it's not necessary. You don't have to do it. Um so the best person to ask, believe it or not, we get great advice from people like our accountant. She usually mm -hmm. gives us pretty good advice. Um, <clears throat> you can also hop on LegalZoom. And, you know, I know that LegalZoom is a really great place to talk about trademarks. And I'm sure that you could probably consult with somebody who could let you know based on your goals if it's something right for you. Is there an ideal time to launch a new shop? Early summer so listings can build a quality score before holiday shopping or late summer, early fall to gain traction? There's no ideal time to list a sh to start a shop. If you don't have products listed in your shop, then they're not selling. Exactly. That's the rule that we go by. It's better to start your shop now, let things kind of build up, make a couple of sales. That way when shops who are already relevant and large start you know, queuing up when people are searching for things, you're not just lost in the sea of listings. Right. Like there's there's no better time. People are people are joining Etsy in droves every single day. Just just start. Just start somewhere. Because odds are you're not gonna start perfect. You're gonna launch and things are gonna go wrong and your shop might get deactivated and then you gotta consult with Etsy, get the shop reactivated. You might, you know, have a learning curve. You gotta go through some stuff to figure out, you know, exactly what's gonna work for your business. You might go through the process of branding multiple times. You know, just start because if you don't start now, then you don't have that time to make those mistakes before, say, the holiday season. Mabel had said, I don't mind the commercials. I want you guys to get paid. I mind the commercials because it's a live format. It's different if it's a 
an uploaded video because it will pause where you are in the video and then continue it. In a live format, it literally just it cuts, cuts, it it cuts it out and you have to go back and rewatch it. And I, as a viewer, don't like that. I would rather open up Super Chat and limit the regular chat to one post every like 30 seconds so there's no conversation spam happening. And then if people want to have a conversation in this, an open forum that's meant for questions, then they can pay for it. That That, it makes more sense to me. We'll try different things and experiment and see what works best. We just don't want we just don't want you guys to have to. I you know, I I don't take like paid sponsorships. No, I don't want to. Never. I don't. I'm here to do this for free. Like I don't want to make it. You know, and and we do get paid for the ads, but like I don't want them to annoy you guys. I don't. No, we pay for our improvements to the YouTube channel through the YouTube money, and the more we improve, the more expensive they get. So if ad revenue starts going down because YouTube makes inevitable stupid changes, then we have to adapt to those changes in order to be able to continue to improve. This camera now is a great camera. However, compared to what things are moving in. I like to stay at the forefront of technology. I like to buy good microphones. I like to stay relevant with cameras and resolution and color editing. We have a new like light. That. I have a new light. This is like a altogether setup is like a $2,000 light. Significantly improves the color, makes it softer, better, blah, blah, blah. You guys don't care. However, doing something like a camera, this is an expensive camera. The next up camera from that is in like the ten dollars to $20,000 range. It takes a long time to save for something like that. And we do it strictly through YouTube. That way we know that we're earning the equipment. That's one o'clock. Okay, so I got to go check things. We know that we're earning the equipment that we're using. We're not just frivolously, frivolously spending money that we should not be spending. Thank if you. that makes sense. Check my email first. There might be an access link. He's. I've got a book release today, so he's buying a book. Um, okay, so what do you recommend doing with Christmas listings, things like cards, or should you keep them up all year? So, I mean, there's two ways to do it. If you've got a large social media audience and you can deactivate those listings for the season and then reactivate them for Christmas time and, and relaunch them, like, for example, you could say something like, you know, these were my bestsellers last year. My Christmas collection is back. Um, you know, if you've got a large social media presence and a large audience or an email list, people are going to be excited to go back and buy those favorites. However, <laughs> if you don't have that large audience, just leave, you can leave that stuff up if you want to. You never know when people are going to buy those items. And believe it or not, if you pop over to erank.com and search for the word Christmas or even Christmas card, and then you look at the little trend graph, you can usually see searches for those types of items start as early as July, which I don't know who, who those weirdos are that are buying Christmas cards in July, but good for them for staying on top of things. Um, just give it a minute. Um, but with, they're kind of slow. With with that in mind, um, if they're not in your shop, no one can buy them. So you never know what people are going to buy. They're probably not going to sell, you know, all the time. I doubt many people are going to buy Christmas cards throughout the year. But you can also always, you know, put them in their own shop section. You can rearrange your shop with the little rearrange button and maybe drag them to the last page of your storefront. Um and then when the holidays come back around, you just drag them back to the front. But having them in your shop, even if they're not selling, it's not going to hurt you. There's there's no damage it can do to have those listings in your shop. Um, is one or two weeks enough time to announce the release of a collection? What day is best for a collection? So do you mean one or two weeks before you release it? Like you, you tease it for one or two weeks? Um, that's fine. One or two weeks is fine. Uh, to to get people excited and start talking about it. That's what we're doing for our, our collection that's coming out um, in celebration of the Crescent City 3, which is a book that, you know, we're officially licensed by the author. But we know that this book is coming out on the 30th. So we are going to be releasing a collection based on the book, close to the release date of the book, because we know people are going to be interested in it. So we're giving it about two-ish weeks of pre-marketing. Um what day is best for a collection? There's no best day. Uh, I like Fridays because I always think, like, people get paid on Friday. I always usually try to release on a Friday, but it doesn't really matter. Let's see. Ch -ch -ch. How do newer Etsy shops gain the trust of potential shoppers when there are zero views or reviews for them to refer to and not much traction overall? How to get over that hump? Um, so there's no way until you get reviews. I mean, it's it's kind of like 
it's kind of like applying for a credit card when you don't have credit yet, where you got to have credit to get a credit card to accumulate credit. But if you don't have a credit, you can't get a credit card to start getting your credit, right? So it's kind of like that. You can't make sales until you get, you know, some good reviews. But if you don't have any good reviews, then you don't have the trust. And there are ways to build trust, though. Um, just making sure that you have your shop filled out, your shop is branded, you have good photos, you've got your policies filled out, making sure that I, I like seeing human faces and photos of my, uh, if I'm shopping from someone, I immediately go to their about section. I skim through that. I look at the photos they've added. I like seeing their face and, and you know knowing that I'm buying from a human, that I'm supporting their brand. If you're a handmade business, making sure that you're incorporating in photos and videos of yourself creating your products can also help with those trust factors. But um, you know, really, it, it's just about getting your foot in the door. So this is eventually someone will will buy. Let's let's face it. Eventually, somebody will take that leap. It's just waiting for someone to do that that is kind of nerve-wracking um God, that was did you get it yeah. thank you um but with that in mind don't stress too much about it because we've actually run surveys over at e-rank where we've surveyed a panel of a thousand people who had recently made purchases on etsy's or on etsy etsy's, per- etsy's um shoppers not sellers actual buyers and what we were able to find is that a lot of shoppers don't really care about how long a shop has been open, the number of reviews, and, and factors like that. So um, if somebody wants your product bad enough, they're going to buy it. Did you answer this one? Yes. Okay. What are your thoughts on capturing Etsy, Etsy customers' emails for a list? You cannot do that. I know someone who mentioned something in one of your trainings about adding something to your Etsy signature line, but I can't oh. remember. Yeah, okay, so that's fine. You cannot directly add customer emails to an email list. They have to have consent, but... Yeah, um, Cheryl, unfortunately, <clears throat> email list marketing, because there's so many laws and legalities and even more coming, I'm actually updating my course right now because there is another big update. It's not something that I can cover here on my channel. It's not that I want to let gatekeep that information from you guys, but what I can't do is answer every question from everybody who publicly sees those questions, you know, or posts questions for me. Um, and what I wouldn't want is somebody to make a mistake based on my content and me not have any way to advise them and then that lead them to getting in trouble. So I don't teach email list marketing here. What I do recommend is um, setting up something like MailChimp. MailChimp is free and following some of the videos and tutorials that they post. Um, what you are allowed to do on Etsy is post a link to your mailing list sign up. You can't post links to your website or anywhere that somebody can buy a product off of Etsy. However, Etsy does say that you can link your mailing list. So if somebody makes a purchase from you, you could always send them a message right after they've made their purchase. Send them a message on Etsy that says, hey, thanks so much for your order. Just wanted to let you know that I received it. It'll be shipping in three to four days. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know. P.S. If you want to stay updated on future launches, um, consider joining my mailing list. Here's a link. That's an easy way to do it. Uh, when trying to create a fashion brand or store, should you follow more Etsy trends or social media trends? Um, I think that you should pick a niche and stick to your niche mm -hmm. and incorporate those trends within your niche. Trying to follow trends, if you're especially if you're not doing POD, you are setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, don't burn yourself out just chasing trends. Because it never ends. Make sure that the trends are applicable to your niche. Um, should you focus more on Etsy trends or social media trends? I mean, there's no real way to answer that because trends are usually... Either, varying. Right, they're varying, and um, not all trends take off, and trends don't just take off just because you've made them. There also has to be skill in the execution of the trend. So um, my biggest piece of advice is just experiment. You know what I mean? You kind of got to test things because the way that you interpret a trend and incorporate that trend into your own brand is directly going to dictate whether or not people want to buy the product with the trend incorporated into it. Um, so just test and experiment. How can I act to get more sales from the USA when I'm in the EU? I had free shipping at first, but then product prices seemed high. Now I switched it off. Now the postage is a turnoff. Um, I mean, I mean that yeah, you control your controllables. I mean, that sucks. But if someone wants to buy something from you, I'm not going to say that the shipping isn't going to be a turnoff because shipping from places like Finland can be expensive depending on the size of the price. 
you're either going to have to you're either going to have to put it into the price of the product or you're going to have to have high shipping. Some people don't want to buy so much from a pro from a shop that shop that uh, charges that high. Some people aren't going to want to pay the high shipping. You can't please everyone. I, yeah. and, and I'm sorry about that, but that's just kind of how it is. Justify your price points with good trust factors and branding. You know, that is that is how yes. big brands like Tiffany & Co., they had a paperclip for like $1,000 that they were selling on their website for a while. People didn't buy it because they needed a paperclip. They bought it because they wanted to be a part of the Tiffany brand. So making sure that your branding and your overall execution aligns with your price points can really help the perceived value of your products to ensure that people are more willing to pay those higher prices. Um, and, and rather than treating living in Finland as like a detriment, treat it as a benefit. For example, I just bought from a Ukrainian shop. I bought some beautiful sun catchers and they included a little card in the package that said that, you know, shipped from Ukraine or handmade and shipped from Ukraine. I gave one of those sun catchers to your grandma and had that card in there. And the fact that it shipped from a Ukrainian shop was a benefit because here in the U.S., we are super uncultured. And <laughs> we live within our little U.S. bubble where anything from a different country is rare and exotic and interesting. And she just thought it was the coolest thing that the sun catcher came from the United or from uh, I almost said United Kingdom from Ukraine. So with that Ukrainian in mind, people are just good at making everything for some reason. They, they Oh, my God. Ukrainian crafts are so nice nice. Um, but with that in mind, what can you do to make the, the fact that you uh, ship from Finland like a cool benefit? Well, um, things that I think of when I think of the Finns, I think of reindeer and snow and beautiful landscapes. Finland. And South I, Park. There are so many things that I think of when I think of Finland as someone who lives in the U.S. I, I have a little bit of leeway in there because my stepdad used to work for a Finnish company, so he went to Finland quite frequently, and we have a lot of um, uh, favorite candies and things that he would bring back. But with that in mind... The fact that you're from Finland, that could really be something that people would be willing to pay more if you incorporated the fact that you're from Finland into your overall brand. So if there's a way to do that, in a, you know, skillfully so that it could fit in with your niche, might be interesting. It might be super basic stuff for you. You know, you might not think like, oh, like reindeer. Nobody gives a crap about reindeer here. They're just, you know, but in the U.S., if you're really, Santa. if you're trying to appeal to our audience um you know that's one of the weird things that we think of when we think of finland so just like you know those of you in australia you're like i hate kangaroos kangaroos are assholes why why would i care about kangaroos but in the u.s that's all we know to think about when we think about australia we're like oh yeah the place with the kangaroos so if you wanted to appeal to people in the u.s then yeah kangaroos would be something that we would say yes i know what those bouncy things are you know Trying to engage with the community. Should I comment on YouTube videos as the brand or myself? Not trying to sell as comments. That's that really, it doesn't matter. Yeah, nobody. <clears throat> nobody's okay. going to buy from you from a YouTube comment. If anything, they'll be turned off by that anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's not a selling. That's, YouTube isn't really a sales place. It's, this no. is. Unless you're like a, a hot social media chick who sells stupid crap on the internet. Just keep, keep it like, remember, it's like a cocktail party, right? You don't walk into the cocktail party and start like, talking about your brand and your business and start trying to sell to people. No, nah. it's it's a casual environment built on community. And when you come in and try to sell within that, it starts to feel kind of icky. There are ways to incorporate your brand into a community, but you have to be the one to foster that community, not enter somebody else's community. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So keep the ads, get paid, we will adjust. You're going to get an ad when you enter the video regardless, and we get paid for that one. Don't don't worry about us. We're fine. Yeah. HAA is our main source of income. We do this for free. Yeah, we'll 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 adjust the ads. I, we do appreciate you guys. We we really do. Um, but if you guys want to um, do something cool and put your put your like cash towards something, consider donating to our charity of the donating. month. Yeah, I haven't mentioned it, but our charity this month is Water.org. They provide clean drinking waters to or water to areas of the world that don't have access to it, and that money goes directly to Water.org. We also have Super Chat. We do have Super Chat. Uh, is Creative Fabrica worth the monthly cost? Couldn't tell you. I can't tell I've you. I've heard of people getting banned using their what is it their their mockups. No, Creative Fabrica. Basically, you're going in and you're buying designs that you can put on your own products oh. to sell. Yeah, I'm not really cool with that anyway. Be creative. Yeah, it's Creative Fabrica. I mean, it's like I if don't you... know enough about it to comment on it. 
is it worth it? I don't know. It's it it's gonna depend. I've seen people be successful. I've seen people waste a lot of money. The thing is, Etsy's a place for creative businesses to create things and creative fabrica somebody else just did all the work for you and then you're just putting it on an mm -hmm. item and selling it that's I, no better than using ai to create stuff to put on a product i yeah, mean really yeah it, i know I, they're in giving it to you well i mean i don't know this is an in-depth conversation that could go a lot of different ways i have a lot of opinions but none of them here's ultimately my opinion doesn't matter okay like my and i try to I try to not, you know, let my own internal biases uh, affect how I teach. There is nothing, to my knowledge, on Etsy saying that you can't do it. However, Etsy does say that your products need to be created or designed by you. And Creative Fabrica, you're not designing them. So I would just be cautious. Because at least with Canva, you know, you're combining multiple elements and using them in a way that is creative so that you have some impact on the design. But if you're just buying a creative fabric design and then slapping it on something and selling it, if you were selling on Amazon or eBay or your own website, that would be a little bit different. But it kind of just defeats the purpose of Etsy. And um, some sellers might see success with it. But as a buyer, if I'm buying from someone, I'm, I'm usually buying because I want to support that individual and their art. And if I found out that you didn't actually create that design, I don't know. I, I might be a little turned off, but that's just me. Um, I'll definitely be turned off. I, I, I don't I don't even buy POD stuff on Etsy. but Yeah. So just, you know, keep in mind that what's easy isn't always what's best. You know, some a lot of the brands that you see that are super duper successful are the ones that like put in the most amount of work. Um that's not to say that you couldn't start your own website no, or fell on Amazon or so. All. It's just not the what Etsy's for. No. Etsy is for handmade products. Yeah. Um, I'm using the trademarked word Frenchie in a phrase. Stop. Uh, if I use the word long tail keywords in my tags, am I safe? No. You, if you use a trademarked or copyright term in your tags or your titles, you are at risk of getting a copyright Frenchie, strike. That's just how that works. Frenchie like in reference to a French <laughs> bulldog? Is Frenchie actually a trademarked phrase? Frenchie is a, is what, just like you would call a, sh, like a Shiba Inu a Shiba. If it's trademarked, it's trademarked. It doesn't That's really true. matter. It's irrelevant. Yeah. The general rule of thumb is that uh, trademark terms can't be used in your tags and titles in any way. Um, so... I find it really odd that that term is trademarked because that's just what people call mm -hmm. just like, you know, saying Sheltie, just like saying <laughs> wiener dog instead of dachshund. Also, you're good. Keep talking. What? That's their brand name. Okay, cool. You're good. I was making I sure that, that. You're, I was making sure that your brand name didn't bring in the most raunchy results possible i love your brand book. name <laughs> weenie riot, no, weenie riot like a wiener dog yeah, don't use it. if it actually is trademarked and you have proof that it's trademarked don't use the term yeah um it sucks but that's just kind of how it is frenchy is i mean nobody could own the term like french bulldog so i would just maybe use the not use the mm -hmm. the term frenchy i would just use a different term if possible uh, where is the best place to learn about new regulations for newsletters? I've heard a lot of people talking about the new rules, but I have no idea where to start. I use MailChimp. Um, unfortunately, I'm taking a $200 course right now just to learn it myself, and it's very complex. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be the one to teach you guys this stuff. I'm no. teaching some of it to my students, but there's some of it that I'm not even comfortable teaching to them. No, and obviously because we don't want to steal content, a lot of what she's learning can't be used in our course. Exactly. And there's a lot of liability with the newer stuff. There's a lot of material out there. We might recommend a couple of free resources. And actually, we don't really link a lot of other things that you need to pay for. But it might be worth actually linking like a paid course if somebody wants in-depth stuff because we don't want to steal content. Yeah. Um, my biggest advice is to make sure that you're researching SPF, DMARC, and um, oh, man, I can't remember what the other one is. Mainly your DMARC. Um, D-M-A-R-C, all one word. Um, I, I wish that I could advise you, but there are just so many complex layers. Essentially, any 
thing that you have tied to your domain name that sends an email via your domain. So that includes if you have some system that automatically sends a tracking number to your customers via your domain. For us, it's like when people buy Handmade Alpha Academy and they get a receipt that comes from Handmade Alpha Academy, that's part of it. Your mailing list is hopefully tied to your domain. Anywhere that sends an email on your behalf needs to be authenticated through your domain, which most cases you're just going to have to do through wherever you bought your domain from, whether it be like, you know, GoDaddy, um, SiteGround, um, what's the other, Cloudflare was the one mm -hmm. that the one chick used. Yeah, people are talking about yeah. it. Uh, SPF, DMARC, DKIM. DKIM. It's a lot of stuff that I don't want to teach to people just because there's liabilities with it. So students, students will get a little bit on that and how to get it set up. Yeah. And then uh, had a couple of comments on the trademark stuff. I use Creative Fabrica and I make no apologies. I don't draw well. But I, am, I do printables, and I'm great at layout and great at original text. I never use them as a standalone. Lots of, lots of mixing. Okay. Uh, so and don't judge. Right. Two things. It's fine if you're taking designs and you're manipulating them if they are given to you to do so. We're more so referring to just taking something from Creative Fabrica, sticking it on a shirt, and selling it. It's the same as Canva. It's not even you're not even allowed to just take an individual Canva yeah. design and stick it on a POD shirt. Those are two things. Two, this is my house. So I'll judge whoever I want. They'll tell me what to do. Yeah, I mean... Not, not <laughs> we're not judging you. We're telling you what Etsy is literally in, ten in their, like, terms for. Exactly. Like, it's I'm not... not I'm not judging you. It's not judgment. We're not saying no. you're a terrible person. No. We're saying make sure that you're being creative with the items that you're getting from Creative Fabric. My brand, I'm a print-on-demand business that makes their designs with Canva. I'm an EDM artist. I take other people's sounds and make them into music. We understand what you're where you're coming from. Right. I I do not create I do not create the artwork that goes on my products and I'm officially licensed by the authors yes. for the items, you know. I I absolutely use elements and combine them in unique ways to create products that I sell sell in my Etsy shop and they sell. However, what I don't do, like like Mark said, is grab one singular design, which is you just said that you don't do, yeah. and slap it on a product. So you're fine. You're just, being creative. Exactly. We're talking specifically about people who are absolutely not creative and just slap crap on a shirt. Exactly. exactly. Uh, related to the listing product changes, how many changes are too many, especially on a listing getting a few sales where it's better to A-B test rather than make changes to an existing listing? The question is, if that listing started selling or tanking, would you know which changes you made affected it. If you're making tons of changes to a listing, you have no way to gauge which of those changes impacted it. It would be similar to if you were running an experiment with three plants and you wanted to know what liquid makes plants grow better. You have three plants and you pour water into one, coffee into another, and Mountain Dew into the third. You would be able to monitor those plants over time and know which of those liquids affected that plant. But if you had one plant and you dumped coffee, water, and Mountain Dew all into that plant, you would have no idea which of those liquids helped the plant or potentially killed it, right? Controlled experiments are the only way to gauge the effectiveness of, you know, the, the changes that you've made. You have to be able to monitor what you've done, so. What'll I do? What do I do? Uh, drink water. Definitely drink water. Eat at least once a day. Eight hours of sleep. Three times a day is good. Two times a day is good. Seven to eight hours of sleep, depending on the person. Definitely. Uh, Exercise? Use the bathroom yeah. from time to time. Oh, yeah. Don't yeah. forget to do that. Move around. Um, have a uh, veggie. Have a, yeah, vegetables are great. Yeah. Have a little bit of everything. Yeah. Get all your nutrients in. Uh, <laughs> I go without Starbucks so I could pay for YouTube Premium. I hate ads for the burning heat for Supernova. I have had YouTube Premium since, like, the month it was available, and I will never go back. Plus, YouTube music is so much better than every other music service. Uh, do, 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 do. Getting an ad every five minutes. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't. We'll turn it off next time. Nah, you're good, uh, Ruth Marie. I'm not, I'm not attacking you. It's just one of those things where somebody was, was mad earlier that their question wasn't immediately getting answered. It's just, it's my house. No, you're, you're fine. And you're good. I, we just, we just want to make sure that everybody knows, you know, here's the thing. No, no matter what, we always have people even ask us, like, what are your opinions on AI? My opinions are relevant, just yeah, like I don't... Yeah, it's irrelevant. Right. My opinions don't matter, just like my opinion right. on 
religion and politics. They're not relevant. I can o yeah. what I do is try to advise you based on what's factual and what we know and what's ethical and what um, consumers are going to potentially how they're going to perceive things. Um, and, and we usually do that based on observations and having that awesome luxury of being able to work with you know, hundreds of thousands of people both through here and observing our users over at E-Rank. So, you know, my opinions on things don't really matter. And I think that you guys value that, not having, you know, because you guys don't come here for my preachy opinions. You come mm. here to learn based on fact and what we know. That's, see, that's where we differ. My opinion does matter and your my word is law. Your opinion <laughs> doesn't matter. My opinion does matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. Would you ever recommend replacing an old listing with a completely new one, deleting the old listing? Depends on why you're doing it. Specific um, circumstances. If you made, if you have made sales on that listing, no. There's no, there's no benefit to it. There's no benefit. You can, you can take even the worst listing that you've had and and resurrect it and make it better. Um, I I can't think of a single scenario where I would delete. A listing all together and start it over. I guess if I had a listing and it had like a bunch of like really bad reviews on it, that wouldn't delete the reviews, but that listing's quality score would probably be so bad at that point that it wouldn't be worth trying to save. That would be like an occasion where I might start fresh, like if I had a ton of one-star reviews or something. But if I had a ton of one-star reviews, then that would be impacting my entire shop as a whole because it would impact my mm -hmm. customer and marketplace experience score. Nancy said, move your body. Move your body. Oh, that was the, that, one of the tips. What, what, the, oh, when yeah. the person said Unless what, you're telling me to stop moving, I've got ADHD. And if you want me to be on topic here, I'm not going to quit moving. He's, he's a wiggler. I'm a wiggler. It's all about how you use the tools available. A wrench is fantastic for fixing the car, not so much for a dish cleaner. Yeah, that's true. It is an effective tool to teach people how to dodge a ball though. <laughs> No, that's that's like that quote that I always say about E rank. You know, people will say like E rank doesn't work. Okay, you can't use a hammer to brew a latte. E you want a bit? E rank does work, but you got to know how to use it, and you have to use it for the right things. Otherwise, you're of course it's not going to work. You know, now that I make them, a, a hammer actually would be fine for pressing the espresso down into the oh my god into the basket. So I think you're a wrong. No. No, no. So you need to change that. No, that's my quote, and I'm sticking to that it. That is the best Christmas present she's ever gotten me. Oh, yeah. That was really a present for me. An espresso machine. We're at the end of the stream, so I don't really care if we get off topic. Uh, I usually get an ad right at the start, but I got one so far. As, yeah. 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 Zero, no ads, more. zero ads so far. I think it's based on what your activity with YouTube is. If you're not somebody who frequently watches a ton of YouTube videos and gets a bunch of ads, they're going to give you more ads. Uh, what about visibility in the active listing section of Drank? E rank. <laughs> I can see some with a really low visibility score. What do you do in that case? So your visibility score is based on um the 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 entire time that that listing has been active. There was a there's a coach that sells like an eight thousand dollar Etsy course who told everybody in her course that you have to have a one hundred percent visibility score on all your listings. We seldom see that. At E rank, you know, being a manager at E rank, if you have a 100% visibility score, like, wow, good for you, because that is not the norm. Um, so basically, your visibility score that's something that's going to change slowly over time. Um, you know, because, it, like I said, it is that listing since the date that you created it. Um, don't focus too much on your on your visibility scores. Don't obsess over them. Listings that have likely sold in the past and have gotten good reviews and positive interactions, like your best sellers, are going to have higher visibility scores simply because Etsy is actively showing those listings to more people. It is natural to have some listings that have higher visibility scores than others. So um, again, it, it's just that slow process of moving the needle and kind of observing um, how customers are, are finding those listings in search. But I wouldn't obsess over visibility scores. It's, yeah. it's just another metric. Gov laws versus Etsy's policies. Uh, I assume the parody rules also apply to fan arts. Yes. Yeah. Like if I sculpted a Princess Mononoke statue inspired a character. A real Pokemon. A, 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 po a real Pokemon. 
it's if as long as it's not based on an actual Pokemon and you're not using the term Pokemon or anything derivative of it, that's completely different than something like actual fan art. Like if I made a Bulbasaur and I made it like a, a plant, plantasaur, like, plantasaur. you know what I mean? Like, like derivative is a little bit different than parody and fan art. They're all different things. When it comes to these kind oh, did we lose the stream? We froze. Sorry, guys. It happens sometimes. It's like negative 15 out with the wind chill right now. So uh, internet lines are a little goofy fiber and all that. Um, but yeah, I, Etsy can make laws more strict for their own benefit. They cannot make laws less strict in order to accommodate people who want things to be different. It's the same as like state versus national laws like states can be more strict but states can't technically be less strict than what the federal law is right same same concept in terms of making a princess mononoke statue though that's gonna you can't do that yeah obviously that's owned by studio ghibli so unfortunately there would be no legal way to go about doing that unless you obtained some form of legal licensing by studio ghibli specifically which I doubt that they issue those licenses because I do believe that Studio Ghibli is, is now under Disney's umbrella, I think. I think that they technically are under that umbrella now, which would make it really, really hard. Emmy came to see us. She usually she, doesn't. It, you know why? Because we're downstairs and she didn't go to the bathroom in the snow this morning. Because she got And now she can't poop in the back room and be a bad girl. So she's asking us, hey, I'm squeezing hard. I got to go poo poo. Did you got to poop? Can you answer me in two words? How can I sell so many listings so that I can stop working and leave for Hawaii for six months on the holidays? <laughs> I'm assuming that was that. So what? So do you what? recommend ads and what size do you recommend utilizing them or budget for them? When do you call it quits on ads? If you're not making money. Um, it, they're always going to be, they're always going to be a gamble. I always recommend the same thing. Put your money behind your bestsellers because there's already a proof of concept. You're more likely to make a return on your investment and you've got a product that you know customers love already. So if you put a little bit of uh, ad revenue behind it, you're more likely to make a return on that investment because if it's already selling well, then with ad revenue, it's likely going to sell a little bit better. Jesus, um, quit spamming your question. So that is my suggestion. But we are at the 130 mark. We are at the more. one. 30 mark. Marco, my opinion on people who buy things on Temu and sell them on Etsy claiming it's handmade while it's not. I think they are people who are exploiting a system and they're probably following some Yathbay chick on TikTok that tells them to do it and they're spamming and oversaturating the market and making Etsy a place that isn't friendly for handmade art. People don't like it. You, the same as people who spam a bunch of crappy non- like ethically sourced AI products on POD things and absolutely saturate the market from people who are real artists who do real work and respect the platform. Yeah. That's what I think. But again, like we discussed for like 15 minutes, our opinions don't really matter. So yeah, um, you're not allowed to do it. So you're not allowed to sell stuff like that That's on Etsy. Right. Um, so does it make sense to report those sellers? Sure. I mean, if it doesn't hurt. Yeah. If you want to, I don't, if, if I think it's more beneficial use of your time to focus on you. Exactly. And if you want to report them, go ahead. Yeah. I'm okay. just going through seeing if there's any urgent comments or anything that needs addressed because we are really far behind. That's okay. Um. So a couple of things, guys. There is a new... Mark and I were just watching videos on AI. There's going to be a new seal of approval placed on ethically sourced AI. Um. What was it? It's like the fair fair trade. It was what was it called? I can't remember. You know how when you get coffee, like fair trade coffee, and it's got that little stamp of approval. There's going to be one for AI platforms that ethically source from, um, you know, databases where people have opted to have their art or, um, you know, uh, wording or or whatever. I don't exactly know how it works, but basically the database has been proven to be ethical and nothing is stolen. Um, we're going to keep up on that and try to learn more about it, but we're hoping to see that in the future. And maybe with that, we'll have more 
um, AI services that we can recommend where things are not being stolen, you know, art isn't being stolen for the sake of creating the, the pieces that you're receiving. I did uh, hear that the AI model that Canva currently uses, unfortunately, with their magic yep. tools mm -hmm. is not ethical. Which really, so, I was really upset by that news. Yeah, I don't have a direct confirmation from Canva. That's just kind of hearsay at this point, but it was a little upsetting. I was hoping that Canva, of all places, would be ones to uh, to ethically source from their own database since they've already got so much creative work that they could use for that. I find it a little odd, but it is what it is. Um, we'll try to keep you posted on that. Next week, we will make it a point to not do this weird ad thing that's going on with today's live stream. I do apologize, and I appreciate those of you who are, you know, sticking with us, as well as those of you who are potentially watching during the replay. Um, and if, uh, yeah, if you guys want to watch our video coming up on Tuesday, I'm going to be answering some common SEO questions. So that should be fun. That'll be fun. Yeah. Y'all. All right, I think we're good to go. We love you guys. Next Tuesday, new video, noon, like it always is. And then... Uh, 12.15. Well, noon. Just be here at noon. 12.15. Be early. It's classy, okay? Noon is when we do the live streams. And then Thursdays over on the E-Rank channel. Um, apologies for acting so tired and kind of sick. It has been so cold. So hopefully you guys are staying warm. I hope is, you guys are staying safe. We're completely snowed in right now. We cannot even leave our driveway because we're just... And if you're young and new and adult for the first time, suffering through your first storm and didn't prepare, you learned your lesson. It yeah. happens. Buy that extra firewood, grab some extra sandwich meat, and get some meat in the freezer because uh, sometimes it's cold out there. Yeah, yeah. All right. We love you guys, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, yeah. It fades. Yeah, it fades, it fades now. Yeah. It, it goes away. It fades. Bye.